So it's very interesting. I mean, I think it's worth just sort of taking a step back, right? I mean, if, mm-hmm. if most people can sort of remember what they were thinking 10 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, 12, 15 years ago. And, mm-hmm. you know, look, the, the human genome was sequenced uh, nearly 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. And the promise of gene therapy mm-hmm. um, was sort of hailed as right around the corner. Mm-hmm. And yet here we are a decade, more than a decade after the sequencing of the human genome. Right. And it doesn't appear that gene therapy through gene editing was Mm -hmm. any closer than it really was from a practical standpoint Mm -hmm. a decade earlier. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bit of a disconnect for people. I think most people who necessarily aren't in a lab would be surprised Mm -hmm. to understand that simply knowing what the sequence of genes are. I mean, Mm -hmm. A, we've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Mm -hmm. We still have no idea what most of these genes do anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have no idea why there are coding segments and the majority of the DNA is non-coding segments. And yet some of these non-coding segments are where mutations exist that result in disease. I mean, all this stuff's still a bit of a mystery. Mm -hmm. Um, But here you're sort of getting at the central or maybe the most important or jugular question, which is if a person has a disease Mm -hmm. like cystic Mm -hmm. fibrosis Mm -hmm. or sickle cell anemia, Mm -hmm. where we really know in unambiguous terms Mm -hmm where on the DNA, uh, where, where in the gene this, this lies, where in the DNA, we know what the substitution is. We know mm-hmm. which C was turned into a mm-hmm. G or a T. Mm-hmm. And all we need to be able to do is go in there and fix it. That mm-hmm. was something we couldn't do 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I, I think for many people, that's quite surprising. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that that's not the problem you were trying to solve, but it's obviously mm-hmm. the world you are you know, you've created. Right. Um, so, so let's, let's talk about the, those steps down that, that road. So mm-hmm. you, you figure this thing, you figure out what CRISPR is, right. you bring yourself up to the state of our discussion today. Right. Right. What's the next thing? The next thing in terms of CRISPR? Yeah. You know, the next thing that you're starting to now pursue, I mean, wh- how are you now going about solving uh-huh. your problem for your good? Cause I, I'm guessing at this point, you're still sort of like at what point right. do you realize you're working on a problem that has a far bigger application yeah. than just solving your problem? I think pretty quickly yeah. uh, since I started to work on gene editing um, because, um, you know, the human genome um, was, you know, the human genome project was completed in early 2000s. And with the human genome having been sequenced and then also with DNA sequencing technology becoming cheaper and faster, um, scientists were able to start to sequence many, many more genomes. And so they can start to make comparisons between healthy individuals and also people who are affected by specific diseases to see what's different between their genomes. And by doing that comparison, they can identify the differences that may be causal for disease. And so, you know, to date, um, based on genetic analysis, researchers have probably identified more than 5,000 uh, genetic mutations that have a direct causative role in disease. And so these are called genetic diseases. They are usually um, you know, affecting a small population of individuals. They're not, they're not as common as things like cancer or diabetes or, or these um, what people call com- complex or, or complicated diseases. But, but nevertheless, um, these are the ones where we know the exact genetic uh, cause. And so the tantalizing idea is then if you know the mutation in the genome, why not just go and fix it? And so that's where gene editing comes in. And, uh, and, and people have since the very beginning been trying to realize this idea. Uh, they were trying to work on it using meganucleases. They were trying to solve this using zinc finger nucleases. Uh, they were certainly trying to use, it, uh, use uh, talons to also uh, treat uh, diseases this way. But the challenge is that they weren't very efficient. And it was also difficult to apply them uh, to be able to treat the disease uh, with sufficient amount of efficacy. When CRISPR came along, um, especially with Cas9, uh, it was much easier uh, to be able to uh, design strategies to, to edit DNA. And, uh, and, and, and that made it much more um, feasible for many, many groups to, to really start to work on this idea. So at this, were you finished with your postdoc and now starting your own lab? Yeah, I had just started my lab uh, at MIT. Okay, so you've got how many PhDs in your lab? I probably had uh, maybe you know 
10 PhD students. Okay. And a couple yeah. of postdocs to yeah. boot. Yeah. And these people have all come to you presumably because they're interested in mm -hmm. optogenetics. Yeah. They were interested in different things. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so at what point do you come back into the lab and say, I'm going to hit pause on the optogenetics problem. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of go down this CRISPR path for a while. I think when I, f when I first started my lab, um, I was already uh, sort of focused on the gene editing problem. I see. And so when students came to me, uh, even though they came to me wanting to work on optogenetics, um, I, I had to convince them that there's this other problem that is also interesting and uh, maybe we can try to work together and make a difference there. Um, and so I, I started to try to tell them about CRISPR, tell them about um, gene editing and all the potential applications. All right, so keep keep going down the story now. So it's it's the early 2010s. Mm -hmm. What right. are the next steps that you take to uh, develop this technology? So when I started the work, so when I first started my lab, um, I was uh, working on talons, and then and then very quickly I had learned about uh, CRISPR, and then I started to also um, sort of get CRISPR uh, projects going on in, uh, going in the lab, and um, and we worked on both systems for a while uh, at the same time. Uh, we pretty quickly realized that talons uh, were difficult to use because of, of the, the cumbersome nature of how to make them. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, um, the promise of CRISPR was much more apparent. So maybe I'll, I'll give another analogy. Um, so we now have a mobile phone and on a phone, there are many different apps. Um, apps that help you book trips, apps that helps you send messages to your friends and family, uh, apps that allow you to take photos. Um, you have a phone and the phone can do everything. Uh, you just load the app onto it. With talons or zinc fingers, the, the analogy would be you have to build a different device for each one of these functions. So for each Meaning gene you're you trying would to need target, a different phone for you each need different app. hardware. Yeah. Yeah, so for every gene you're trying to target, you have to build a brand new protein mm. to be able to target that gene. And that is a very cumbersome and, and, uh, and not very effective process. With CRISPR, the promise is that CRISPR is like the smartphone. You can load software onto it to recognize different genes. And the software is the CRISPR RNA. These RNAs are very easy to, to chemically synthesize and you can uh, define the gene by reading off of the sequence of the gene, which is already completed through the Human Genome Project. So all of that was just you know, a step function uh, improved over the zinc finger and, and talent technology. Um, so, so anyway, so, so, so we realized that if we can make CRISPR work, um, not only in a bacteria, but, but I'll, I'll put it into a human cell and get it to recognize things, um, genes in the human cell, uh, then we can have a much more powerful a much more uh, democratized uh, gene editing system. So what was the breakthrough or set of breakthroughs that led to the uh, utility of this? And did it start with, let's just silence a gene first? I mean, let's figure mm -hmm. out how to go in and with precision bombing, mm -hmm. silence one gene. Was that the first problem mm -hmm. before the, let's actually take a strand of novel DNA and put it in? Right, so uh, CRISPR is a natural nuclease. So in bacteria, it uses the guide RNA to recognize the virus DNA. And then once it recognizes it, it will cleave the virus DNA. So make a double-stranded DNA break. Um, and, and so that's what we're trying to um, sort of make happen in the human cell. Uh, we try to program Cas9 um, with a guide RNA to, can, to go and recognize a specific gene in the human genome and then be able to cut it. Which is valuable. I mean, there are certain yeah. cases where overexpression of a gene is pathologic, right. and if we silence a gene, we right. fix a exactly. disease. Yep. Exactly. And so, um, so uh, there were um, a lot of studies done on how uh, breaks in the DNA would get uh, repaired. So Maria Jason, uh, Jim Haber, they had studied uh, maybe a couple of decades uh, before that um, how DNA repairs would, would get processed. And so what they found is that when you make a cut in the DNA, so when you make a break, it will activate repair processes in our cell. So in fact, our DNAs get DNA breaks all the time mm -hmm. and we have a robust process to be able to fix them uh, to, and prevent mutations. 
so so anyway, so what Maria, uh, Jason, and, and Jim Haber found is that if you make a cut in the DNA, that cut will activate one of two different repair processes. The first rep repair process will glue the DNA together, usually correctly, but in a very, very small number of instances, it will introduce a mistake. Mm -hmm. And that mistake will inactivate the gene. So it will no longer make the protein product that it's supposed to make. And this is very useful if you wanted to inactivate something in the cell. Uh, sometimes there, there are mutations that are deleterious. And if you can inactivate that deleterious mutation, then you can make the cell healthy again. And so that was a very powerful method. The second repair process is called homology-directed repair, HDR. And this relies on a template DNA that carries the sequence that you're trying to repair with. And so if you make a cut and you also provide a template DNA, then the repair process will copy whatever that's on a template into the DNA break site. And this is a more powerful way to be able to change the DNA sequence in, in a design fashion. Is there a risk when you cut the DNA and it repairs, that it repairs in a manner that remains pathologic, even if it's distinct from the path that was already there? It is possible. Um, but but the probability is much, much lower. Okay. Yeah. What about kind of the holy grail, which is to literally edit a new gene, to, to put something in that didn't exist? Mm -hmm. um, what was required to take that leap? Yeah, so, um, so, you know, there are different ways that you may want to change the DNA sequence. You may want to inactivate something, you may want to delete something, and then you may want to insert something. So to do each one of these, you need to have... Uh, uh, a machinery that will allow you to uh, do that. So the holy grail would be to be able to insert a gene into anywhere you want uh, precisely and also very efficiently. And and to date, that ability is still not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still working on, and many other groups are, are working on, developing technologies to make that happen uh, with high enough efficiency. Uh, we can do it now with very low level, maybe less than a percent or maybe just single digit percent. Uh, but for a big gene that we're trying to put in, uh, we, we don't have a good way to do that yet. Okay. So currently, is it possible to snip DNA anywhere you want with the current technology? Yeah. With CRISPR, with Cas9, we can, we can pretty much target throughout the genome and, uh, and make cuts. Uh, 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 uh